it's really exciting as we move forward with Respectful Workplace Week to have such a variety of speakers this year. Today's theme is on um, systemic discrimination, systemic racism in the workplace. And we have the Commissioner on Systemic Racism in New Brunswick, as well as the Human Rights Commission um, uh, speaking, as well as JEDI, which is a group that does um, economic uh, development for Indigenous communities in New Brunswick. And then this afternoon, we have Dr. Carmen Poulin, who is speaking um, on her research at UMB. And I think it's really vital as we move forward in Respectful Workplace Week to continue to acknowledge and address um, the fact that systemic racism has a real impact on employees all over the world, but it, you know, in New Brunswick as well, and that that's something that we should look about, look at, and think about as we think about how to address um, how to address keeping our workplaces healthy and respectful. Um, so today I'm just going to meet myself for a moment here as we, as we wait for Dr. Verma, but I think it's going to be a really exciting presentation. We're just getting sure getting Dr. Verma on now. We're just having some technical issues as we get her connected. I want to um, remind everyone that we have three full days of, of events. So we have speakers tomorrow that are looking at tips and tools for um, tips and tools for creating and maintaining healthy and respectful workplaces. So we'll have speakers that are coming more from the service provider side that are working in this field. Um, and then on Thursday, we have speakers um, focused on trauma-informed workplaces, which is a really interesting topic. And it's the first time that we're addressing that topic as part of our, um, as part of our uh, Receptor Workplace Week events. This is the first year that we are looking at the impacts of um, difficult working conditions and, um, you know, vicarious trauma on the employees that are working in our workplaces. And so to do that, we're looking at, um, you know, labor unions, we're talking, you know, having a presentation from the New Brunswick Nurses Union who certainly experienced an incredible, um, you know, incredibly difficult working conditions in this last two years. And we're also looking at um, and talking to folks from the nonprofit sector, which is an exciting addition for us um, to really look at some of the other workplaces that are being impacted by that, um, that uh, sort of vicarious trauma and trauma-informed work. So Dr. Varma, thank you so much for meeting us today, for coming and presenting for us. Thank you. Sorry for the um, uh, confusion. I'm not, uh, not the best at this, I guess. <laughs> no, no problem. None of us are. None of us are coming from a particularly technological background. Yes. Uh, I'll introduce you all to Dr. Varma, or Commissioner Varma now. So um, Dr. Manju Varma is the Commissioner on Systemic Racism in New Brunswick, and today she'll be presenting um, a session called Commissioner on Systemic Racism, The Journey of Exploring Systemic Racism in New Brunswick. Commissioner Varma arrived in Canada with her family as a young child. She was raised in New Brunswick, and her work is focused on issues of anti-racism in predominantly white locations in New Brunswick. 
In October 2021, she was appointed New Brunswick's Commissioner on Systemic Racism, the first of its kind in New Brunswick and in Canada as a whole. So we're very excited to have you here today. Um, welcome, Dr. Verma. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm really excited as well. Um, I actually, when I was putting this together, I was thinking like, what am I talking about? Um, because I know that the the whole the whole theme is res you know respectful workplaces, and actually my background is in diversity and inclusion as a whole. So I talk about you know um, making places accessible with people with disabilities. Donc je voulais rendre les endroits accessibles aux personnes avec des handicaps, les problèmes de santé mentale. Je parlais de de créer un espace sécuritaire pour les minorités de genre. Mais maintenant, je suis commissaire au racisme systémique. Donc, une des choses dont je parle cette année, ça a été le racisme, le racisme systémique particulièrement. Alors, ma présentation aujourd'hui, et ce dont je vais parler, c'est un mélange de tout ça. S'il vous plaît, posez des questions dans le langage. Please ask questions in the language of your choice. Some are in French, some are in English. So if um, if you need some um, some more information, please just speak up. Um, I am a big fan of interruptions because I think sometimes you know you have an idea and if you wait till the end of the presentation, if you're like me, you forget them. So please, at any time, put up your hand or even just speak up. Okay, um, I can't see everybody. So if you do have your hand up, uh, perhaps Nicole, you can help me out with that. Yeah, absolutely. So I okay. don't believe they're able to put their hands up in um, webinar. What will happen though, is they can make comments in the chat. So I'm happy to keep okay. an eye on the chat and to raise those comments. Perfect. Um, or and I like guess... I said, you don't have to wait till the end, like just absolutely just speak up. <laughs> <laughs> to me, this is a, this is a conversation, absolutely not a presentation. So, with that in mind, you'll see that I have a title slide, and I've crossed out the word diversity, and I'll get back to that towards the end. But what I really want to talk about is um, how do you live difference in the workplace in a way that's respectful, respectable respective, sorry, and um, and also equitable. And we'll talk a little bit about what equity means as well. So I thought I'd start off with my role, like what, you know, who am I and, and what is it that I do? So there was a bio, but my role as commissioner is uh, much more narrower in scope. So it is a one-year mandate. I was appointed in October, 2021. And my mandate was to examine um, the extent and scope of systemic racism, not overt racism. But having said that, um, I heard a lot of stories about overt racism, which then informed me on systemic racism. So for example, um, I've spoken to a lot of kids who have told me about bullying in school, uh, name calling, and some, you know, as young as kindergarten, like this is, this is not middle school or high school stuff. It's like happening, you know, for some of these kids, the very first day of school. So while that is overt racism, um, the fact that schools didn't have a policy in place, or oftentimes teachers seem unprepared to deal with these issues, that's an example of systemic racism because they're not getting the training. So even though my scope is looking at systemic, a lot of the overt racism experiences that I heard of definitely, um, definitely informed my work. I've been speaking to stakeholders, individuals, um, a lot of uh, a lot of people contacted me themselves. So when I was first appointed, I put together a list, you know, kind of like the, the the usual suspects, and multicultural associations, universities, community colleges, those hospitals, those sort of uh, institutions, because I didn't want to approach individuals and say, "Hey, uh, I heard you experienced racism. Could you share your trauma with me?" Like that's not how I wanted to approach this. So, um, so we did things to open doors, and a lot of individuals 
did come forward um, to um, to share their stories, and, and I'll um, I'll talk to that about that in a moment. So my um, the results that I'm that I'm supposed to demonstrate is in October, at the end of October, I am to present a um, a report to the government of New Brunswick with recommendations on how we can start to remove the barriers that create systemic racism and how we can fight systemic racism as a whole. So when I looked at this role, uh, I should say there's never been a provincial commissioner on systemic racism in Canada <clears throat> or in the United States. So I really was left with what, what do I do? And how am I going to do it? Right? So I kind of had to create the um, the position. There was no template, so I decided to focus on my intentions. What were my intentions for applying for this position, and what is it that I want to to um, achieve? So, and I, I focus on intentions because to me that's a really important part of having a respectable uh, workplace, having a place that's equitable, a place that's inclusive. Is it always starts with intention? These things don't generally happen um, by themselves. Unfortunately, not fighting systemic racism can happen by itself. And that's because the ways that we do things are so normalized that we don't have to have the intentions to support systemic racism. So if we do nothing, we are supporting systemic racism. And I wanna be clear, that doesn't mean we're racist. It just means that we are part of a system that doesn't recognize the diversity and the diverse needs of people within that system. So I wanted to really look at my intentions and they were to be approachable and also to be transparent. Um, approachable because while it's me that's writing the report, this is really a collection of voices. I did not want to you know, sort of take my laptop and go hide in my basement for a year and read a whole bunch of reports and then create my own report. I really wanted this to be a collection of voices of, of New Brunswickers, whether they belong to uh, racial minority communities or not. So that was one thing, to be approachable. The other thing is to be transparent. Um, there was, I'm not sure if you know about this, but there was, a lot of um, controversy around this position. Um, you know, there were some groups that wanted to see it in a different format. Others felt it wasn't enough time. Others felt my mandate was too broad. Um, so while there was a lot of support, there was also a lot of questions and concerns around, around this position. So I wanted to be as transparent as possible so that people felt comfortable um, you know, sharing their concerns and also be able to look at what I'm doing and maybe hopefully address some of those concerns. So one of the ways I did it is, uh, is I did set up a website. And if you go to the website, you will see that our mandate's there, our team is there, uh, we have a timeline that's there. We are on our timeline. So, um, so, you know, we're very transparent about what work we should be doing right now. And I also started a podcast, um, Talking Racism with Manju Varma. It's very focused on New Brunswick issues. And again, it, um, I, I would give sort of an update on, um, on where our team was. So that was you know, one way to, um, to be transparent and approachable. Another way was really to openly share my, um, my, my progress. So this particular slide, we have been, we're asking that it be added to my website. So hopefully it will show up on my website soon. So we've had over 125 recorded conversations. And by recorded, I don't mean uh, recorded like the session is being recorded. I mean that it's actually gone down in our books that we have met with certain groups. So these groups include um, the HRAs, like the health, uh, the health authorities. Um, they include some schools, universities, uh, organizations, um, anyone who was willing to go on record for speaking with us. Then we have over 80 private conversations. And these, like I said, are mainly people who contacted me and said, I have, um, I have an experience or I witnessed something and I really wanna to talk to you about it. Again, most of these were about overt racism, but like I said, it informed um, 
you know, informed my ideas of what maybe is happening in some organizations. And it also verified some of the information that we were hearing in our recorded conversation. So they're extremely important. However, like I said earlier, I did not want to approach people. These are people that approached us. Uh, and over 30 presentations, uh, keynote speakers or being on panels or doing work like this to really share the work that we're doing. I have found in the past with commissions that there's a lot of hoopla at the beginning and then there's a lot of attention paid at the end, but very little conversation in the middle. So it was really important to me that, um, that we have a continual focus on the work that we're doing um, throughout the year. So the podcast, as I explained, we also had official submissions where um, we asked any organization or individual who wanted to write something in, and that request is on our website, who wanted to write uh, their experiences or their suggestions, and it could be in any format. I had a student email me and ask if she could do a TikTok video, and I was like, yeah, I have no idea. At the time, I had no idea what a TikTok video was. I do now, uh, but I was like, absolutely. Like any, the, Take the word official out of there and just however it is you want to submit. So those particular submissions will be included with the report. So they are public documents. And then we have the open door policy, which is exactly what it sounds like, is, um, is just being able to talk to people. Um, I have been, uh, I've been like stop, uh, you know, I've been out for a walk with my dog and someone will stop me and say, hey, you're doing this work, right? And like, yeah, and then we'll end up having like a 20 minute conversation on the sidewalk. So when I say open door, like I really mean open door. Um, the other thing that I've tried to do with, uh, with this position, and it is outside of my mandate, but one thing I realized as I started this work is a lot of people don't know what systemic racism is. Uh, you know, you, you say the word racism and a lot of people will get their back up, you know, and say, I'm not racist. And, and that's not what systemic racism is. What it is, is this process that we're so used to that uh, benefits some racial groups and uh, marginalizes others. So I thought as part of today, so this is part of the hodgepodge, um, that I would just give a little bit of education around the history of racism in Canada and, uh, and how it's part of a system rather than you know, individual acts. So that first part that I just finished was about the work that I'm doing. So um, I'll now move into, like I said, kind of a retrospect or how difference has been treated from a racist perspective, a systemically racist perspective in Canada. Um, but before I do that, does anybody have any questions about what I just covered, like the sort of 101 of, of the work that I've, I've done? I'm just keeping an eye on the chat. I haven't seen any questions yet, Nanju, but I'm very intrigued. I've written down the name of your podcast. Okay. It's an interesting way of engaging with the population. Have you found that there's been much listenership to that? It, you know what? It go, it comes and goes. Um, we When we first started, um, there were a lot. We had like an incredibly high number of listeners, which was surprising because usually it's the other way, you start off small. And then we had a dip around Christmas time or January, we do it once a month. Um, but it really depends on the guest as well. I do very little speaking, I, or I try to. But um, we had um, Nelson Mandela's great grandson on, um, on, I think it was episode two or three. And it really got shared a lot. I got a, I got a lot of comments on that, a lot of feedback. Uh, we had the first and only anti-racist coach and educator in New Brunswick on. And again, a lot of feedback. Uh, we had an elder on, a lot of feedback. So it really depends on the guest and the topic because different topics are going to interest different groups. That's really exciting. And I, I'm going to go back and look at your back catalog. Yes, um, yeah, absolutely. 
I realized that um, as we, as the theme of this session is neither of us are tech savvy, Manju or I, I've realized I am able to allow people to talk. So if you do, I've got an eye on the participants list. So if you um, do you want to put your hand up, let me know and I can call on you to ask your question instead of you just having to type it in chat. Um, so sorry to interrupt with that technical piece. Go ahead, Manju, with the rest of your presentation. Yeah, no problem. So, uh, like I said, we're going to get a little bit of history. It's going to be fast because I know uh, you know I have limited time, but it really is meant to 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 demonstrate how we can have actually. So approach. sorry. Can I? I did just have a question come up. Can I jump yeah, in? Sure. I know you would wanted this to be a conversation. I think this yes, is an important question. Yes. Christine says, "I think many of us feel we are educated on this topic until we realize we are not as aware as we think." How do we check ourselves and become more aware of our own full pass? Okay, well, that's a good question. Uh, I'm going to jump ahead then. Um, for me is, you know, the, the question I get asked a lot is a variation of that. Like, how do, how do, I, how do I teach myself? How do I make a difference? And so um, I talk about intentions, goals, and authenticity. So the intention is, what is it that you want to do, right? And, and as I said, like with my own um, work, I really had to think about that. And it sounds like a pretty flippant question, you know, well, I want to fight racism or, but it's like, okay, but what is it that you want to do? So when I sat down with, uh, with the premier and, um, and some of the ministers, they talked about creating a welcoming province. It's like, okay, great. So that's the intention to create a welcoming province. Well, what does that look like? Because, you know, I could invite you to my home for dinner and I could have like a five course dinner and, you know, you show up and everything's laid out. There's tons of appetizers. Or I could invite you to my dinner or to my home and it's a potluck and you have to bring certain things, right? Both are welcoming, but they're two very different realities and they require different type of work uh, from the parties. So to say you wanna be a welcoming community sounds fantastic, but at, like you, you need to have an understanding of what you mean by that. So, um, so intention is really important. And um, you know you can see it in different ways. So, for example, if you're looking at re recruitment, are you waiting for people from various backgrounds to apply to your apply for positions, or are you going out to job fairs, to indigenous communities, to do that recruitment? Um, are you um, having conversations about privilege? We're ed actually educating people about privilege. Um, the calls to action. Many many organizations are looking at the calls to action and saying, okay, which ones are applicable to us? And we're going to be intentional. You know, we're purposely going to address those calls. They will not happen accidentally. And then other organizations are saying, okay, what what groups, what stakeholders that maybe we don't normally work with, can we now create partnerships with? So, you know, it's it's one thing to say you're intentional, but you really need to understand what that means. So it's almost like this layer of intentionality. Um, the other thing is um, knowing what your goals look like. You know, it's one thing to say, well, I want an equitable workplace. Okay, well, what what does that mean again? And how are you going to measure that? Um, some companies will do audits and they will do things like a language audit and look at the language and their policies. Um, is there, you know, is the gender just male and female, for example? Others will look at the language of their workplace. Like what are some of the terms that we're using? Um, are, we, are we valuing employees who bring different languages to the workplace? Um, uh, the most common is training. And training can be great as long as the training is followed up again with, with more goals and with more intentions. Uh, I'm a trainer in diversity and inclusion, but I will be the first one to say, if you just provide training and then you never come back to it, you know, it's, 
it's like training someone to play basketball, but you never play a game. Well, they're going to lose those skills. So um, it's really important that you understand what the goals look like as well. And then also being authentic. It cannot be a check mark. And people know when it's a check mark uh, because it screams check mark. Uh, for example, um, I had a, an organization reach out to me, not as commissioner, but as a trainer. So this was a couple of years ago. And uh, they wanted the 10 hour training session, but they wanted it in two hours. And I said, well, I can't do that. And they were, they were like, well, we can, we'll pay you for the 10 hours, but we want you to do it in two because that's all the time we can, we can put to this. Well, that's not authentic, right? Um, that's checking, checking a box. Um, no neutral ground. If you're going to be authentic in this work, then you have to take a stance. So in the past, I think we've uh, we've had this mindset that we're, uh, there are people that are anti-racist, you know, people like me who potentially do work in this area. And then there are people who are intentionally racist, you know, supremacists. And, and, but in between is this huge swath of ground where most people are neutral. Like I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm obviously not a white supremacist, but I don't do anti-racist work either. I'm in this comfortable middle ground. And if you're really authentic about making change, you recognize there is no middle ground. You are either fighting systemic racism or you're supporting it. And that's that's a big decision for people. You know, it's a big reality to accept. And then it's a big reality to follow through on because now you just can't be comfortable and let things happen. You're either a change maker or you're keeping the status quo and the status quo is racist. Um, so it's pretty clear, but it is it is difficult to uh, to live that clarity. So um, I, used, I used a couple, I jumped ahead to answer that question, but hopefully I did answer it. Do you have any, any follow-up questions or does that, does that make sense? I guess it's a good place to start. I think that's wonderful. We haven't got a follow up. Um, I think that that speaks so highly to making those actions. Christine has said makes sense. So I think that speaks to, to taking those actions, making those decisions consciously in our own lives. And also, I want to say anyone who wants to reach out to me after, please do. Um, you can email me directly, you can go to the website, like whatever however you'd like to um, you know, reach out to me. If you have a question, you want a follow-up conversation, um, I am always open for that. So, so please do that. So um, if that is the only question, then I will do a sort of a quick history. And I love that actually the questions are making me move forward. That, that makes me feel like, okay, I, I did pick the right things to talk about because people have questions about it. So that's, that's fantastic. So one of the things I do talk about when I talk about systemic racism, because such a huge topic, right? And we did do um, a survey of 600 New Brunswickers about systemic racism. And what we found was that uh, the vast majority, I think it was like 72%, um, had, had, didn't know what systemic racism was, or they said they had a, a very small understanding of systemic racism. So if you're trying to create recommendations that will engage the public, it's hard if they don't know what it is. Um, so what the next few slides are sort of just to give you a, a brief history of, um, of how difference has been treated in Canada. Now I say in Canada because I use Canadian examples, but um, I think you would find the same patterns in the United States and, and some other countries as well. So the first one is that um, difference is, uh, oh, I think I found this button. Oh, perfect, okay. <laughs> difference is seen as something that is dangerous and antithetical to the Canadian identity. So, you know, we're being, at a time when we were forming as a country, uh, we had this idea of what a Canadian looked like. Um, and it was a lot about uniformity. And when we look at, the ways that other systems were set up, like classrooms, it was all about uniformity. You know, there was no uh, no special curriculum. We all sat in rows. Um, we all had the same you know the same expectations, the same benchmarks, and anything different was seen as a threat. So 
kids were not allowed to speak their mother tongue if it was outside of English on the playground, for example. And uh, anything that was uh, different was not only seen as a threat, it was also seen in many cases as uncivilized. And so, you know, the most, uh, most horrific example we have of that in our history is, um, is the residential school system where it was set up specifically to promote a Canadian identity or someone's idea of a Canadian identity and also to, um, to get rid of uh, difference. And you know, when you look at the language that's around setting up residential schools, you will see it's a language of, of uncivilized, a language of promoting an identity and, and as such getting rid of another identity. So like many things in government, you know, we, uh, we do one thing and then we sort of swing over to the other side. So we went from eradicate, or sorry, eradicating difference to insisting on difference. And what this was, was making decisions based around people's difference. Now that might sound great on paper, but um, it, the decisions that were made around difference always advantaged one group and disadvantaged another. So for example, in schools, you know, boys were encouraged to go into math and science and girls were encouraged to go into what we used to call the soft skills, you know, things uh, that, that were caring professions because there was this idea that differences were biological. The interesting thing about making differences biological is that you can't call it racism. You know, the idea, is, or at least that's the argument, the argument is, well, if it's biological, it's natural, it's, you know, and we're just following a natural way of thinking. So, for example, if we think about that, what does that look like in policy? For example, there was, you know, maternity leave for women, but no leave for, um, <clears throat> for fathers. And, well, because, you know, it's the woman, the mother that naturally should be staying home and it's the father that should be going out to work. So any woman who didn't want to stay home was almost seen as suspect, like, you know, what's wrong with you? You wanna go back to work? Aren't you a caring mother? So it not only was social precepts, but also, you know, right in our policies. Uh, we saw it in academic work where it was uh, quite acceptable to argue that certain groups were uh, more dangerous, certain racial groups were more dangerous than other racial groups. They weren't as intelligent as other racial groups. They were less civilized. Uh, they were more inclined towards addiction. And, and these are not ideas that we have left in the past. You know, they still follow us and they still impact policy as well. It's just, we do it in a way that perhaps is not as overt as we used to do it. And what's also interesting from a historical perspective is much of this stuff, whether we're talking about eradicating difference or insisting on difference or the next approach that I'll talk about, it's not taught. So when we went through this process of trying to get rid of difference, we didn't teach that in our history classes. When we went through a process of insisting on difference, we don't teach that. Um, in our uh, in our history classes or in our social studies classes. And some of this is very recent history. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with, um, with the fruit machine. This was an actual machine that was invented by Canadian scientists used by the RCMP. And it was used on federal civil servants. In fact, if you Google the fruit machine, you'll see that there's a documentary on it and it's very good. I, I, I really suggest that you watch it. Um, and what the fruit machine was meant to do is they would hook up uh, federal civil servants who were accused of or they, it was suspicious that they were homosexuals. And... Um, if they would show them a series of images and depending on how you responded to those images, it would be determined whether or not you were gay or straight, you know, using the language of the time. And if you were gay, you were fired. And, and this was like in the eighties and the nineties. So this is not ancient history. So we went from eradicating difference to insisting on difference. And then we went to my all-time favorite, 
the colorblind approach. And this is where we hear people say, you know, oh, I don't notice that that person is black or I didn't notice that that person is in a wheelchair. And it sounds great on paper because it just means, oh, we're all treated the same and, you know, and, and everything's fair. Well, that actually isn't the case. When you say to somebody, I do not notice your skin color, or I do not notice your gender orientation, or I do not notice your sexuality, what you're doing is you're refusing to acknowledge a, an important part of their identity. And because of the way our society is built, you're refusing to acknowledge that there are certain barriers um, that, are, that are connected to their identity because of a systemic approach that, that doesn't value difference. So, um, you know, and like I said, this is a very common one because it sounds so lovely. You know, we just treat everyone the same. But in my view, and this is just my opinion, I find that this one is almost the worst because it is presented in a way that helps everyone when it actually isn't. Uh, an important part of the colorblind approach is to know the difference between equity and equality. So equality is treating everyone the same. And we've seen that, like, for example, in our school systems, we see that in our workplaces. I don't know how many times I've heard managers say, I don't want to use employment equity. I want to treat everyone the same, right? So it's this idea that everyone starts at the same place. Well, if you look at the cartoon on, it's my left hand, so I'm assuming it's on your left hand as well. Um, yes, everyone's starting at the same line. They're all gonna leave when they hear the gun um, and they're all running towards or moving towards the same finish line. But there are some huge discrepancies here. And if we were betting people, I would bet on the person inside that black car. So yes, they're being treated as equal, but they do not have the equal access or equitable access to, uh, to success. When we look at the other cartoon, um, it's, you know, it demonstrates the difference between equality and equity. So from an equality perspective, sure, everyone's got a box there, but we see that one person doesn't even need the box and the other person, the box is completely useless. It's so equity says, okay, instead of everyone getting the same amount of support, let's give them supports that are, um, that are usable for their own particular reality. And we saw a lot of that during COVID. And so my hope is that, uh, that, that's, going to, um, that that's going to be able to continue very soon or be able to continue past COVID, that we're gonna to continue to think like that. So the final one is uh, difference uh, as uh, as trendy, and that's that's very much where we are right now in society. Is this idea that um, you know a surface knowledge is enough to know about diversity, inclusion, and equity? So um, I said I told you I would talk about my title at the beginning. Um, I'm going to go to my last slide right now. This is what it should look like, because I find that a lot of organizations will really focus on diversity, but they won't really pay attention to the inclusion and equity part of a workplace. Um, so I always argue, let's forget about the diversity. Let's make our workplaces inclusive with the people that are there right now. Um, and if we do that, if we make our workplaces inclusive, if we make our workplaces equitable, the diversity will come. If we focus on the diversity, but we don't move into the areas of inclusion and equity, the diversity will leave. And as we enter you know, a labor crunch, we're going to see organizations that um, are going to have to demonstrate very clearly that they are inclusive and equitable places. And that's the same whether we're talking about an organization or we're talking about the province. Really, all of this is a journey. And um, you know, I think in many ways we have this idea that we need to 
get to a place right away. And, uh, and we, we really don't think about the journey. An example of that is, you know, the push that we've done on immigration in the province, which is fantastic. Um, but then we haven't really put in a lot of strategies on how do we make New Brunswick attractive? How do we, uh, how do we create community so that people will stay and that and that Monk, or New Brunswick is not used just as a um, as a type of like entry port. So the I the the remembering that this is a journey is really important. So I'm going to do something a little bit different. I am going to show these questions, and um, and then I'm going to give everybody about five minutes. I'm going to stop talking so you can have a, a break from my voice. Um, I did not tell Nicole I was doing this, so my apologies, Nicole. Uh, <laughs> but you see no that No problem at all. Okay, great. You'll see that there's questions here. Um, I would like everyone to just pick one, think about what their answer would be. And like I said, I'll give you five minutes and uh, I'll even turn my camera off so you don't see me staring at you. Um, and um, and I'd like to address these. And once I've addressed them, it would be great if anyone has extra to add to it, because these are the types of questions that come up in a workplace. So, um, so I'm going to uh, to do that. Does anybody have any questions before I do that? You can pick whichever one you want. Just think about it. You don't have to take notes. Nothing. There's no pressure. I won't call on anybody. It's just, I'll give you a few minutes to think about this. Well, I'll just take a little break because, you know, it's hard to listen to someone's voice for a whole hour. Um, and then we'll come back. Uh, you can even go get water while you're doing this <laughs> or any sort of biological break you need. And we'll come back to this slide and, um, and I will go through these. And at, then I'd love to have some feedback. And, and feedback also means that you disagree with me. Right? Someone just has asked. I, I'm so oh, sorry. sorry. Someone has asked, what is EE? Oh, sorry. My apologies. Employment equity. Okay. okay. It's an actual policy, but you don't need to think of it in that way. You can think of it just as whatever organization you're with. If there was a decision to, oh, we're going to focus, we're going to prioritize hiring of women, or we're going to prioritize hiring of people with disabilities, you know, that sort of thing. That's what, uh, that's what employment equity is. My apologies for that. Okay, so we'll Great. set our clocks for five minutes and uh, I'm gonna turn my camera off and then I'll be back. All right. I wanna actually, we have a couple of questions in the chat that I wanted to ask you about and you can feel free to answer them now or integrate them into the activities you're doing or as we go. The first one is, I've got two, so I'll ask you both if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. The first one is, is there any way we can provide full-time teaching opportunities for qualified people of color in the New Brunswick education system? There exists a huge challenge for the many qualified people of color who can help provide quality education here, but they are unable to move past a seemingly supply teacher only barrier. The benefits for this, sorry, there's a street sweeper going past my window as we speak. The benefits for this would be huge for the New Brunswick education system for both the students and educators throughout New Brunswick. So that's the first question. And then, I've, and then there's a question that says, what are your thoughts on intent versus impact when it comes to the color blind and the differences are trendy ways of thinking? How does this relate to authenticity or of intent? Okay, yeah. Uh, let me look at the so I'll address the intent uh, in the questions intent versus impact in the questions um, the the one with the teaching it's you know it's interesting because it's first day of school right for for many kids today uh, so it is an interesting one uh, I agree I, I I don't think I could provide an answer because if I could. <laughs> It would call the Department of Education, um, but I can certainly agree with the person who who posed that, who made that comment. Um, our schools, just from what I'm seeing, 
from what I'm seeing in numbers. Um, having I had two children in the school system, they've now moved on to university, but seeing you know the schools, the, the makeup of schools have has changed incredibly. And the makeup of our educators have not kept up. They are not representing the diversity that we're seeing in classroom. And this is problematic. The other thing that's not happening is, again, we're not talking about racism. It's a really uncomfortable word for a lot of people. So the word kind of gets couched in other terminology. Um, for example, when my daughter had a racist incident in her school and I had to go speak to the principal about it, his approach was, well, we have a, a respect all policy, which I said, well, that's not the same thing. Schools need to have an anti-racist policy uh, because you need to call it what it is. Um, so that's, there are, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in education and certainly um, having teachers of various backgrounds in the classroom is key to that. My, you know, I, it, it's, I've learned a lot doing this job. Um, and one thing I have found, and maybe it, it has to do with uh, inefficiencies, uh, maybe it has to do with not speaking to each other, having silos, but everyone seems to see that this is an issue, but no one seems to have the clear mandate to address it. So whether we're talking about unions or we're talking about the licensing process, or we're talking about um, you know advocacy groups, um, everyone sees that there's a problem, but like I said, they're not, it's not being addressed. And that is one of the concerns and one of the issues that I want to talk about in my report. And it's not just teachers, I'm seeing it, you know, in healthcare. Um, I'm seeing it really in a lot of the licensed professions. So it is a huge issue. We need to get teachers of various backgrounds into the classroom. So I know that's not really an answer, um, but uh, I do share the concern. <laughs> it's just... And uh, so the second one, uh, well, first of all, is there any, any comments on that or any feedback from that? Nothing. Oh, Carmen Poulet has her hand up. Carmen, yeah. Carmen is one of our presenters later in the day. My my uh, comment is in response to what you said during your presentation when you and your title. I'm really concerned about the ability of diversity to be seen. And so if we leave diversity out, we leave out models. And I think young people need to be able to project themselves in the future as part of this system or whatever. And leaving the diversity piece is problematic for me. I know the problem with quotas because I deal with that reality in my research, but this is, I don't know how to, um, sorry, I should have turned on my camera. I'm, I don't know how to deal with this statement that you made that we should leave diversity out of the equation. And I, I, I'll apologize because I, I guess I wasn't clear. I don't feel that we should leave it out of the equation. I feel that it shouldn't be the first. Like we, you know, oftentimes we talk about diversity, inclusion, and equity, and the diversity is here. We, you know, we walk around any of our cities. Um, the population has changed. We see it with our students, uh, with our international students, with the growth of of our immigration. It's here. So. Um, my argument is if we only focus on that, if we only hire people to diversify our workplace and we don't deal with racism, we don't deal with sexism, then we'll lose that diversity, The people will go elsewhere. But if we focus on inclusion and equity first, you know, um, that the diversity will come because it'll know it's, a, people will know this is a safe place for us to work. I get the sense that, that there's a conversation there that, yeah. that underlies that point about not having the not having the visual diversity as a checkbox. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I just wanted but, to let you know we're at 13 minutes before the hour. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> but uh, Carvin, if you want to have like, you know, th these are just my thoughts. If you want to continue this conversation, I would be happy to do that. Well, maybe this afternoon with my yes, talk, yeah, I'll maybe some of the <laughs> questions that why I'm asking those questions. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, no problem. Great talk. So uh, let's go to these questions. And I picked these questions because they pretty much are versions of questions or comments that I have heard whenever I'm doing presentations about work, you know, respectful workplaces or inclusion in the workplace. And um, so I wanted to just, you know, uh, sort of highlight some of these and just not really address how to answer them, but how, why they're problematic. So the first place, you know, my workplace is not diverse. Why should I, why should I prioritize it? Well, um, you know, the, the response to that or the reason that that statement is problematic is, first of all, you don't see all of the diversity. When you say your workplace is not diverse, you are, you're implying, you know, that there's a, that all diversity is visible. And by not prioritizing, you know, a safe place, a respectful place, you are not, um, you're not prioritizing a safe place where people can express their identities. You know, I spoke to a woman who is has a, an Indigenous background. She's had the same manager for the last 10 years, and she's never shared that she's Indigenous. Um, so that means for the last 10 years, she has been hiding an important part of her work. And she said when she moved to virtual, um, the first thing she did before the, you know, all these virtual meetings is to check out the room she was in to ensure there was nothing there up on the walls or books that would somehow imply that she had an Indigenous background. So when I hear people say that, well, my workplace is not diverse, it's like, okay, your workplace is not visibly diverse, but I can almost guarantee it that there are um, that there is some diversity in your workplace and some of it probably is marginalized diversity. So again, I guess that brings me back to, you know, let's focus on inclusion and, and then the diversity, those with that want to bring different parts of, um, of their background into a workplace, know they can do so in a safe way. We have a question mm -hmm. from Philomen. I'm just going to allow you to speak. Should be able to unmute now. Oui, uh, bonjour. Uh, as je m'appelle Philomène. Yes, hello. My, my name is Philomène. Hello. Yes, effectively, the question of diversity cannot be important uh, regarding to inclusion, but we find ourselves to be uh, diversified in a context where the, those who are uh, responsible are homogenous, and then they call you to the table just to bring about your, to, to listen to your point of view, but the person who's take, making the decision, the decision team is always homogenous. Yes, yes, you're right. For me, it's the case, and this is the reason why I think we have to target the, the higher ups, because I think Carmen said the same thing, is that we have to have uh, I don't have the wor words in French, but uh, the models at the workplace. Yes, you are totally right that now the majority of managers and leaders are white. <laughs> it's not just homogenous, but let's be honest, they're white. See, um... Also, we can talk about uh, this to see how we could have a an environment or a workplace that is uh, welcoming also if i don't see people like me in the workplace then how welcoming is it uh, you know what is the brand of that workplace 
So it's not just a person that cannot make decisions. It's also some people that create environments and, and uh, organization image as well. Thank you so much. Because we find ourselves, we're usually called to the consulting tables to bring about ideas, but we're not asking us to join the decision tables to be as members of diverse, you know, uh, groups. Yes, yes, that's the case. Thank you, Philomene. We have two or three minutes left before the end of the presentation. So maybe I'm going to target one question. One question, and that was with the intent versus um, versus impact. So um, the second comment, I'm so afraid to offend someone that I'd rather not talk about diversity. I hear this all the time. And, and people will try to explain, you know, like, oh, if I ask someone where they're from, I generally want to know where they're from, or, you know, I travel a lot and I'd like to know if they're from a place that I've traveled. And I get that. That is uh, completely reasonable. What I try to talk to people about when I say intent versus impact is another thing called episodic versus uh, historic. And if you've never heard about it before, that's fine. I made it up. So uh, that's great. You probably shouldn't have heard about it. Um, so what, and I find the best way to explain that is through a story. So I'm, I was interviewing a young man who is in high school and uh, he's black. And he was telling me that from the very first day of kindergarten, he was called a racist name by this group of three or four boys. And it continued all the way to grade eight. He went to a small school, the same kids are in his class. And so for you know nine years, kindergarten to grade eight, these boys go out of their way to taunt him, to bully him, to exclude him. And very little was done in the school. He then goes off to high school, it's a big high school. He finds you know, people he can hang out with. He's doing well in school, he joins some sports. So one day he's waiting in line for the bus and one of these boys is behind him in line and the boy calls him a racist name. This young black man turns around and in his words, he said, I beat the crap out of him. The next day, they're both standing in front of the principal. The principal sees an episode. You got called a name and your reaction, your violent reaction was inappropriate. That young man, sees this as a history. I have been dealing with this for several years and this, my response was not a, a response to being called a name. My response was the history of being called a name. So let's put this now back to where do you come from? So, um, you know, I might say to, I might be in a conversation with Nicole and I'll say, and Nicole will mention something about a school and I'm like, oh, where did you grow up? Like, where's home? And because I'm going to guess that you're not asked that question very often, no. she sees it as an episode. She didn't, um, but maybe we didn't have that conversation. Maybe she asked me first, where are you from? Because I am asked that so often. I react as from a, a historic response to that question where I'm like, oh, here we go again. And just automatically assuming I'm from somebody else. So your intent your intent might be honest in that, oh, I just genuinely want to know, you know, what school you went to, or I think you might know somebody that I know, but the impact may be different because of systemic discrimination, whether it's sexism, whether it's racism. And what do you do about that? Well, first of all, you recognize that it's a reality and it's, you recognize it's a reality that perhaps you don't have to live, but other people do. If you offend someone, you just apologize, right? The example I use is, let's say, you know, Nicole and I are on the beach and we're playing Frisbee. And uh, I'm gonna pick on you, Carmen, because you're the only face I see on the screen. And Carmen walks by and she gets hit in the head with the Frisbee. You know, I'm about to throw it to Nicole and Carmen walks by and gets hit in the head with the Frisbee. Now, I didn't mean to hit her in the head with the Frisbee, but I'm gonna apologize. It was not my intent. But I'm not going to walk up to her and say, gee, Carmen, I'm really sorry that your head is so sensitive that you got hurt by my Frisbee. That sounds funny. 
but you'll be surprised at the number of people who say, oh, sorry, you're so sensitive. I just really wanted to know where you're from. I just really wanted to know how to pronounce your name, at which I say it's five letters, like, you know, make the attempt. So um, it's, it's tricky, but I think if you think about things, like, as I said, from a historic and episodic dichotomy, it helps you understand the situation better. Unfortunately, that principal wasn't able to do that. So he suspended the black student longer than he suspended the white student. So what message does that give to the black student, right? He's talking to a white principal who, who pretty much supports the white student and tells the black student that his behavior was inappropriate. So, and that's another thing that we have to start to do is really looking at things from historic rather than just always an episodic. Unfortunately, many of our policies support episodic responses than they do historic responses. I see I have one minute left, so I'm gonna <laughs> stop. <laughs> I can say I'm never on time. I'm on time. <laughs> this so. has been so, so fascinating and interesting though, Manju. We've had lots of comments in the, in the chat box about how direct and clear you're making it. You know, one person commented that it's unsettling to hear some of this, you know, when you're talking about there being no middle ground about uh, between um, supporting or, or not supporting systemic racism. And if you do nothing, you are supporting it. And talked about being unsettled by that, but maybe we need to be unsettled. And I, I think, yes. yes, I think that's very true. I think that one of the most important pieces when we look at this in a workplace perspective is that we have to be aware that this is happening and it's existing under the surface of those episodes that that we see if we're not someone who is a person of color or who is um dealing um with a disability or any of the elements that that make us part of the privileged group that isn't seeing those elements yeah and it's like i said earlier it's a journey you're not going to wake up tomorrow and say, okay, I am now, you know, officially fighting systemic racism. Because it really <laughs> is, you know, you have to think about a lot of things that we take for granted. It is like the air that we breathe. Mm -hmm. you know, um, I don't think anything when I go looking at a bath for a bathroom, a public washroom, and I see a male and a female, or at least I used to not think anything. Once it was brought to my attention, now I do notice. You know, um, so it is, and I have this little cartoon here, right, about we always shovel the stairs first. Well, let's start shoveling the ramp first, you know, so that everyone has access. That's and, a thoughtful, thoughtful part. Way. That's, and, my, that's and, my homage to first day of school and snow days and all absolutely. that. Absolutely. <laughs> and what, um, what a wonderful truth and reality that we should think about, but also what a great metaphor. Yes. Yeah. I didn't, I stole that. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you so, so much for coming and speaking. I thank know that you. you're getting thank ready to present in October and you're yes, busy. That's the plan. <laughs> but we're very excited. We look forward to seeing the report that you put out. Um, I want to um, encourage anyone who wants to connect with Dr. Varma, with Manju, to, to connect with her through her commission website.